What's Your Position podcast may contain adult themes, sexual discussions, and strong language. We want everyone to be educated, but we are intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Live from Nana's Backyard in Garden Grove, California, this is What's Your Position? On today's show, we talk about shame. With Aunt Linda in the audience and Frank Sinatra, the intern cat, cat roaming around. And now, you know what they say, fool me once, strike one. But fool me twice, strike three. And now your host, Ashley Weller. Welcome, fellow humans, to another episode. A quickie, if you will, of what's your position. Fool me once. Strike one. The quote, sir, is fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. You know, actually, you want to know a really funny fact about that? I just had a brain flash. Do you want to know the first person who ever taught me that phrase? I'll, no. Hey, Alan, how are you doing today? No, yeah, tell me. I'll give you a hint. Yeah. She's sitting at this fucking table. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> She is, uh, darling. Yeah, when well, I, I lived with right. when I lived with you, you said that to some effect, something, and it stuck with me. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, that's my bad. I let you back in. So there's that. What's that from? Does the audience know? Fool me. W- Sarah, no. no, that's a good guess. That's a though. really good guess I'll, with I'll, the baseball the reference. Baseball. Wow. No, it's Michael Scott. Oh, come on. <laughs> on what's your position? We do like a baseball analogy. Yeah. So I, I, par- like I do a lot of office quotes. Sorry, guys. It's fine. Everyone but me loves it. So if I do it enough, she'll watch it eventually. I won't. Uh, today we are talking about shame. So here I am. It's a gorgeous Saturday here in sunny Southern California. Ha ha suckers to the rest of the United States. <laughs> It's like 72 and clear, and I'm staring at a swimming pool. I'm grateful. Also, I woke up this morning, and my producer said, hey, you're coming over to Nana's later. If you want to come over beforehand, I've got some time. We can we can do a quick episode. And I was like, okay. So I go on Instagram, and as one does, and I started getting all of these like things about shame, like how to get over sexual shame or the types of shame that women experience in relationships. And I was like, all right, universe, I hear you. Let's talk about shame today. So someone out there needs to hear this and it, it's not me, but somebody does. So here it is listener. Just for you. Might be Instagram. (laughs) They feel shame. They should. Do you? Do they? They probably don't. Um, So we're going to talk a little bit about shame. I'm going to describe to you kind of the overarching idea behind shame. There's a lovely woman who everyone should listen to or read or 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 get to know. Her name is Brene Brown. Um, Again, thank you, darling, because uh, she said, oh, you should look up Brene Brown. She has a great great quote on shame she and she really does she wrote a whole fucking book on it uh, she did a ted talk on it so we're gonna give kind of an idea of what shame is in a vernacular that everyone can understand because when you look up shame on like psychology today it's very technical and 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 wordy and verbose and Brene really sums it up beautifully so i'm going to talk to you about what shame is and the five factors that contribute to shame and then i'm going to talk about men and women specifically and the types of shame that they experience on a regular basis surrounding sex so the kinds of shame that are experienced um, in the in gender differences are huge. Like men and women have, and this is just we're talking just straight up cisgendered heterosexual shame. Like well, I'm not even getting into the LGBTQIA world of shame because that's not my area of expertise, and I would rather have someone else come on and talk about the kind of shames that that they've experienced in that world. But this is sort of just an overarching idea of what shame is. It's also just a quickie. So back up. Because I ain't got that much time. Uh, And then we're going to talk about some ways that you can get over your sexual shame and reclaim kind of your um, identity and your bravery and undo the the mental trauma that you've gone through pretty much from birth and the ingrained shame that you have within you. But first, I want to give you something. It's 
It's my favorite thing in the entire world. I swear to God. Uh, tips for safe sexting. Sexting gets a bad rap, I feel like. And everyone's, oh my God, you sexted. Oh my God, you sent nudes. I sent pictures of my boobs to my husband all the time. Like if he's not paying attention to me and he's sitting right next to me, I'll take a picture of my boobs and, and text it to him. And then he turns around and he's like, hey, boobs. <laughs> this is great. Sexting is a really great way to connect with people, especially during a pandemic. Whether you're in a long-term relationship, whether you're married, whether you just swiped right on them yesterday, I've got some tips on how to sext safely and also have fun. Consent is the number one thing that you want to make sure is what you got back there. Just putting some background. Oh, that's not the full one. Is this Bo? Yeah. I love him. Putting the uh, sexting song in the background. Thank you very much. Consent, 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 everybody. Nobody wants unsolicited dick or boob pics except my husband my husband always wants unsolicited boob pics there's literally not a time in the day that he doesn't want those but i've asked him so i know consent 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 please do not send somebody a chat about how you're going to bend them over and rail them from behind without asking first if they'd like that to be done to them Make sure you are both comfortable with the level of sexting that you have and that you both have enthusiastically said yes. So if someone said, if you say, hey, I want to send you a dirty picture, do you want that? And they're like, um, I guess not super enthusiastic, right? So maybe be like, okay, maybe another time. Or um, is there something specific that you don't want to see or something specific that you do want to see? It shouldn't be confusing. It's literally written down in the text. If somebody says no, they're not playing. They're not joking. Don't send it. If someone says yes, send it immediately. It means they want it, right? Enthusiastic yeses is what we're looking for. Check in regularly. Just because somebody wanted to talk about having sex on a train yesterday doesn't necessarily mean they're in the mood for transportation and boning today. They might be in a work meeting and they don't have time for their phone to buzz and for their genitals to buzz. They don't have that kind of time today. You want to check in on the regular. Are you into this? Can I send you a picture? Can I tell you what I want you to do to me? Checking in can also be really hot in conversation when you're talking about like, do you want to know or what what kind of video would you like me to make for you? Or do you want to know what I would do to you if I was with you right now? Like that kind of like leading and exciting questions can really make the conversation hot. I'd be like, uh, can you use like a different frame rate, baby? <laughs> maybe use like a different lens, maybe something wider, something maybe maybe a prime le- lens, something real depth of focus in there. Oh, yeah. My film friends will think that's funny. I'm sorry, what? I fell asleep. Hey, you know what? In our world, that's that's sexy. Mm. You can't judge. You're shaming me in my, <laughs> my, my sexy film talk. You're right, I'm sorry. God, Be mindful of your nude taking. All right. You can send any comfortable, any picture that you're comfortable taking, right? Any picture that you want to take, you should. It's your body. Doesn't mean you have to send it, but if you want to take a picture of your penis next to a Arrowhead water bottle, just to kind of see what the dimensions are and if they match up, go for it. You know, that's fine. How about those like little, like the smaller Gatorade bottles? Not the big ones. No, like no, the, the mini ones. Yeah. Yeah. But, but then okay. is it like a, like a size, like depth proportion? Like no one really knows if it's the big one or the little one, if you don't have like your hand in there for you size. Some, uh, fil- what do they call that? Magic. Perspective? Yeah. Force perspective. Yeah. Oh, like I, Will Ferrell and Elf. Yeah. There you go. You could look like him and, and the Gatorade bottle hey. could look like one of the elves. Goes both ways, ladies. Use those boobs. Yeah. Make them look bigger. Yeah, you could you know there's a butts. lot of ways. Don't use the the photo Don't alter. Photoshop. Come no, on. no, no. Be real. Use science. With the rise of revenge porn, re- I really want to make sure that people are sending nudes that maybe can't be traced back to them. So maybe don't don't send a picture of your boobs and your face or maybe don't send a picture of your dick if it's got a tattoo of a shark on it because who has a tattoo of a shark on their dick that guy right and then everyone can see that his shark dick isn't the size of a Gatorade bottle and I don't know you don't want it you don't want especially if you're texting a new partner Uh, but that's my tip of the day sexting can be fun sexting shouldn't be shamed especially when you're in a relationship where you can't see each other all the time it's an exciting way to keep your relationship alive thoughts do you sext 
You don't send your husband nude pictures of yourself. Oh, you know what, though? Your husband doesn't text. No, he doesn't. So, like, it's not really like he would sext because he doesn't even send you regular texts. I come from a generation of um, people taking nude photos of themselves and they end up in the Inquirer. Ah. Talk about heavy shame. Heavy shame. That's Do you dirty talk when you're in person? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so dirty talk is there. It's just not on a device of any kind. All right. Have you have you have you sexted, producer? Not lately, but yeah. In the past. <laughs> I would understand. I would actually be like, "Excuse me, with who, sir? Yeah. When do I get to meet no, her? Yeah, Thank you past. very much." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, it was yeah. kind of more of a. I, I didn't re- really. I don't think I pressured too much. I mean, it's hot. It is hot. Um, but it was like a give or take thing. That, yeah, you know, you, one for one. Kind of. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I see something. You see something. Yeah, but I, don't, I, only, I only have one thing, so it sucks. They have, <laughs> you guys have like three things. <laughs> only have one thing. You guys don't really want to so, see my butt. Phone sex was way before. Phone sex. That's true. Hey, okay, so, so, darling, your husband went on tour, right? So he was gone for months. Months. How, how long was the longest he was gone? Two months with David Lindley, and and during that time, on average, if you had to give it like a weekly, like once a week, twice a week, once a month, twice a month, how often would you have phone sex with your husband? I have to take the fifth because it'll incriminate my husband. Okay. What would you say is a good average for a couple who maybe are, are long distancing their relationship? What's a good average? Three times a week. Three times a week is a Three times. We, we got a microphone for, for Darling here. We got one. Um, you can incriminate your husband because I promise you he doesn't listen to this podcast. Uh, but <laughs> three times a week. If you are away from your significant other and you want to keep the magic alive and now you can phone sex with FaceTime and like actually see what's going on. It's like instant porn. Instant porn porn right yeah. if you had the ability now to facetime if if your husband was on tour and and he could facetime and you could facetime would you do that instead of phone or would you still want to do the phone and use your imagination i would probably do the facetime because i don't like the tracing of texts no i mean like would you just do regular phone oh. or would you do facetime oh facetime right so yeah. you could see it because i want to see i want to fucking see it yeah fuck yeah yeah I wouldn't do the FaceTime thing unless I'm in like a very serious committed. Oh mar- no, marriage. for sure. We're I'm not, not doing that dating. Married thing. So, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That seems mm-hmm. odd. I don't like FaceTiming in the first place. So all right, well, let's do <laughs> yeah, some unofficial. Actually, I, I don't hate it. It's not. It's actually, I FaceTime with everybody. I guess it's a little better than a phone call. Legitimately, um, my siblings, if they if they listen to this episode, it's my favorite thing to do is to FaceTime them. And sometimes, side note, I'll get a FaceTime from Lindsay, and instead of Lindsay, it's Barry. <laughs> oh, my niece and Barry is the one on the other end of the phone and it's like what? How does Barry know how to use the phone she doesn't no. but she asks to call Auntie smart Ashley baby. she is a fucking smart baby she'll ask she, Ashley and she'll point to the phone because she thinks that's where I live and so <laughs> Lindsay will FaceTime me and then she'll hand the phone to Barry and then you see Barry's little face looking down at it like the golden retriever on the memes and, <laughs> and then you open it and it's her face it's precious she's precious uh, FaceTime is great I love that shit uh, we're going to talk about shame uh, in in pretty uh, an overview of shame this isn't a great detail of shame but the universe told me today that we should talk about this according to Brene Brown shame and guilt are two completely separate things so we need to make sure that we understand that marker right away guilt is adaptive and helpful if I hurt someone's feelings and I feel this sense of, you know what, I think I did something that may have hurt another person. I should probably apologize. And it can also help make me better as a person, right? Because I'm growing. I'm understanding that I have made an error. I'm correcting that error. And I'm learning from that error. That's helpful. Shame is believing that you are flawed and therefore unworthy of love or belonging in some sort of social construct, whether that be sexual, whether that be religious, whether that be familial, 
Um, it's something that we have experienced, done, or failed to do that makes us unworthy of some sort of connection. I, I think that shame can be looked at, confused with guilt constantly. Like, do you have any examples of the differences between guilt and shame? Can you think of any? Um, yeah, I think when you misspeak to someone and hurt their feelings and realize you maybe stepped over the line, mm -hmm. I think that's guilt. Mm -hmm. I think when... How can you tell the difference in your heart, though? Like, the other day, Kevin and I got in an argument, and I was defensive and he was critical, which, by the way, are two of the four horsemen of the apocalypse of the end of a relationship. Defensiveness, criticism, stonewalling, and resentment are the four horsemen of the apocalypse of relationships. And I was being super defensive. And even if you are defending something that you didn't do, it's still negative. It's still a bad thing because if you are secure in yourself and your behaviors and you set good boundaries, there should be no reason to feel defensive. If you feel defensive, there's probably something that both of you aren't necessarily getting to the root cause of. He was being critical. I was being defensive. And I felt this like thing in my stomach and it was anger but it was also like I'm not wrong I might be wrong <laughs> but I'm not wrong I'm gonna look it up and I looked it up why am I defense why is my partner making me feel defensive and everything I looked at was no one's making you feel defensive you need to fucking change that shit like <laughs> you need to work on that so I sent him a message I said hey I'm working on being defensive I know that that's negative but you're critical I didn't say it like that I basically said I feel criticized a lot. I feel like I, you know, I hear a lot of criticism and it hurts. So I get defensive because that's my reaction immediately. It's not necessarily the best reaction, but, but it is. When you feel like that, is it because it makes you feel shamed? Ooh. E oh, oh. That maybe. Be, yeah. Because you're being told like adult child. Yeah. Right. Child. Yes. Yes. It, de it definitely reverts back. Shame. 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 With okay. the bell. That's Shame. So we want to make sure that we can understand the difference of looking at things through a lens of either guilt or shame. If you actually did something hurtful to someone else, if your actions affected another person's boundaries, yeah, there's probably the need for an apology. But once you apologize and you make efforts to make amends and make a change in your life, the feeling shouldn't linger. That's where we get shame from. Five factors that contribute to shame, all right? Self-awareness. In order to experience shame, you must first be aware that other people are judging you. So if you're walking around completely oblivious to the fact that people give a shit that your ass is hanging out of your jean shorts, you have no shame. And we, we as a society say, oh my God, she has no shame. As, as if that's a bad thing. I have one example. Please. Ashley at Disneyland. What? <laughs> Was your ass hanging Excuse out? No. Excuse me. But she, has, she doesn't give a shit about the kids. Oh, no, I don't. She plows through. She has no sh no, shame. No, no shame. Plowing through the no, kids that's my to get part. to R2-D2. I have video footage. Fuck yeah. <laughs> R2-D2 would much rather hang out with me you than have, a five-year-old. You have no self-awareness in, in the world that you're in. No. <laughs> I stand back and look through, look at these kids through the lens of them, like they're seeing R two D two the first time. But she wants to be friends right away. That be, that's my friend. That's R two D two, bro. You want to come on with me? Let's go. That's a really great point. I have no shame at Disneyland. Cuts in front of people. Yep. Yeah. Not in line. Sometimes. Not in like lines on the rides when they like merge. You know, sometimes it's two become into one kind of thing. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And if people can't figure out queuing, I can't help them. There's no, I'm not, I'm not here. No, to, you're a professional. I'm, I'm not, a professional. I'm not... Get out of my way. Disney magic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> she's got shit. She's got magic to do. Guys. Got magic shit to do. <laughs> yeah, magic shit. And her magic is more important than yours. Yeah. It's not. It's just my magic is planned out and thought out. And I know exactly what my magic is going to do. And you need to take time to figure out your magic. I'm not. Here for Go your back magic. to Hogwarts, uh, different, <laughs> different, different franchise. <laughs> Self blame uh, is a huge proponent of shame. So, 
shame and guilt are emotions of blame. So in the course of daily life, bad things are going to happen, right? You're going to cut somebody off accidentally or on purpose. Um, You're going to say something that inadvertently offends somebody. Um, You're going to misgender someone that you didn't realize was a gender that you called them out on the wrong gender. Assessing a situation like blaming our spouse for not doing their part or not answering the phone incorrectly attributing responsibility uh, is a, a huge proponent of shame. So let's take the obesity epidemic in this country. Okay. When we incorrectly attribute obesity to an individual Rather than a society, we create a society of shame surrounding weight. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying there are factors that play into the reason this person is morbidly obese or this person has to ride a scooter, not because of a broken leg or because of cerebral palsy, but because they are obese, we immediately blame the person. Instead of looking at the context as a whole, like the fact that America puts sugar in bread (laughs) or sugar in pasta or the fact that food is every, you know, when I go to a different country, there's no fast food. Like I go to fucking, you go to Italy, you go to like, literally when you're driving through their country, no fast food. Maybe in downtown Barcelona, I saw a Kentucky fried chicken. I will kind of agree with you. They do have fast food, but you don't see drive throughs Right. Okay. They. I saw a burger. I went to Burger Kings and I went to McDonald's and I went to like their own versions of those, you know, they, yeah. they have them there. They just, I, one thing though, they don't have drive throughs They also don't advertise them. You get to walk and drive yeah. in and, get and they it. don't advertise them like no, there's no fine. billboards there's no television ads for it we are shoving literally shoving food into people's heads and down people's throats right so rather than the environment or the context the obese person feels the shame what do you want what do you, what are you what are you doing over there i'm looking up videos got it one of them also in. we make assumptions about people in scooters that oh yeah are heavy maybe they have maybe they have maybe some they have nerve issues yeah bad knees yep bad back yep but no they're in the scooter because they're fat. because they're fat because they eat too much you have no idea if this person broke their back in a car accident and now they can't work out right. they can't get out they are in constant pain right. do you know how i have a fucking uh, uh what is the what am i trying to say not a deviated septum that's in my nose A herniated disc, Mm. which causes sciatic back pain. And I have fibromyalgia, which causes just daily pain. And sometimes it sucks and I can't go to the gym. I couldn't imagine having chronic. You have chronic pain, ma'am. And it causes you to not be able to work out specific parts of your body. No. No core work whatsoever. No squats, no sit-ups. Yeah. That's awful. That's why I got a belly. Well, (laughs) also because you're a woman and that's where your uterus lives. Standards. We all have a belief about what is acceptable in society and what our standards should be. For example, at a funeral, we know that laughing is probably not acceptable, right? Now, some people grieve that way, though. Some people can't. They uh, that's how they grieve is they want to experience some other emotion besides sadness and they laugh or they tell a joke to diffuse their sadness or their anger or their frustration. Have you seen that? like Irish video where <clears throat> the it's outside it's out in a cemetery and the families <clears throat> they're putting the they're putting the uh, coffin in the ground uh-huh. and everyone's very sad it's very quiet and all of a sudden there's like this hello hello let me out of here let me out of here <laughs> and the the guy that died told like somehow Stop. figured out and did one last joke and everyone just started laughing oh was, my yeah. god that's so sweet he gave his family one last laugh i'm mm. literally tearing up that's amazing it's pretty good um in our society social standards are huge so my sister Lindsay, i'm gonna mention her again wow hi Lindsay. hello uh She just wrote an article for a parenting magazine about what it's like to be a parent in a foreign country. And one of the things that she talked about was car seats. Because in Thailand, no one uses car seats. No one. 
they drive with their babies on their laps. They drive with them on scooters. And this actually is an interesting thought because that happened in Montenegro when we were there. It happened in Turkey when we were there. It happened in Italy in some of the parts, definitely in Sicily. I didn't really ever put two and two together, but honest to goodness, I don't know if I've ever seen another country be so adamantly like you can't leave the hospital when you give birth in this country. You cannot leave the hospital unless you have a car seat. That's true. You're not allowed to take your baby home unless you have a car seat. But in other countries, they just trust that the parents are going to keep their children safe. So when she was in Thailand, she actually felt shame Because she had a car seat. Wow. And then she had to get rid of that idea that she needed this car seat. And they just took Barry around on their scooter because she had a little baby helmet and Lindsay would hold on to her in a backpack. And then Lindsay would hold on to Zach and Zach would scoot around. And when they came home, they had to readjust to the idea that if you don't have a car seat, you're a bad parent and we're going to take your kid away. Personality traits are also highly ingrained reasons that people feel shame. Um, Any sort of self-consciousness that you have about yourself that that has been ingrained in you since you were a child, like uh, your hair or your weight or your skin or your gender or your identity, we grow up with these ingrained into us and we can actually develop shames about these. So self-esteem is the last five factor that contributes to shame. Um, Anyone who has a bad sense of self is probably going to feel more guilt and shame than someone who loves themselves, someone who believes what they say, someone who um, has a good moral compass and uh, and knows that what they're saying is either backed up by by something they've read or that they've they're not speaking. They're speaking impeccably. Mm -hmm. Hi, four agreements. (laughs) Thoughts? Um. I can say that the from 18 to 25, because of the abusive relationship I was in, mm-hmm. <laughs> I lived in shame. Mm-hmm. Of shame of I what? What told, were you ashamed of? Well, I was told constantly that I wasn't a good person. I didn't have a good memory. I didn't do things right. Uh, completely controlled by shame. Yeah. Sounds like gaslighting. Yeah. Well, it was yeah. pretty much. And I think that is still so prevalent in this society yeah. where not just women but you know it can be women doing that to men too controlling them with shame and yeah you know, manipulation yes yeah. and when it gets ingrained in you it takes a long time long, to turn it around long time and it takes so, a lot of work it takes yes. a lot of self reflection it takes a lot of therapy uh Brené Brown has a great TED talk if any of you are interested in learning the differences between guilt and shame for the purposes of this podcast we're going to talk about sex and shame because i feel like uh that we are going to i feel like sex in this society is most definitely um the biggest contributor to the shame that we feel. There's a lot of societies where sex is open and welcome. The Netherlands, shout out to the Netherlands again. Um, But there's a lot of societies where sex is so shameful that you can be put to death for some of the things that you enjoy or that turn you on or that you feel you want to experiment with. So when we come back from our amazing break, We are going to discuss the six signs of sexual shame. That's a really fun alliteration. The six signs of sexual shame. And then we're going to talk about the differences between how men and women experience sexual shame. Come on back. Want to get something off your chest? Have a burning sex question? Call now for a chance to be live on air with What's Your Position? 513-69-69-SEX. 
That's 513-6969-739. We will answer your questions, hear your comments, and play you live on air. Call us soon. And now, a What's Your Position sexy moment in TV and movie history. Now, penetration and coitus, that is to say, intercourse up to and including organ. Ah, hello, dear. Do stand up. My wife enters the room, Carter. Oh, sorry, sir. Sorry. Uh, we'll take the foreplay as red, if you don't mind it. No, of course not, Hamilton. So, the man starts by entering or mounting his good lady wife in the standard way. Uh, the penis is now, as you will observe, more or less fully erect. There we are. Ah, that's better. Now, Carter. Yes, sir? What is it? It's an ocarina, sir. Bring it up here. The man now starts making thrusting movements with his pelvic area, moving the penis up and down inside the vagina. So put it there, boy. Put it there on the table. While the wife maximizes her clitoral stimulation by the shaft of the penis by pushing forward. Thank you, dear. Now, as the sexual excitement mounts at what's funny, Biggs? Oh, nothing, sir. Oh, do please share your little joke with the rest of us. I mean, obviously, something frightfully funny is going on. No, honestly, sir. Well, as it's so funny, I think you better be selected to play for the boys' team in the rugby match against the Masters this afternoon. Oh, no, sir. Welcome back, fellow humans. It's a little Monty Python for your, uh, for your day. A little Monty Python sex scene, yeah, Monty Python. That's it. I love it's a great scene. God, He's, John Cleese, I, and I don't know if you, the listener could tell, he is literally having sex with his wife yeah. in the classroom teaching them and they're just losing no their deal. shit and he's and the kids are still playing and stuff. You know what he doesn't have? Mm. Shame. <laughs> <laughs> he's got no shame. Mm-hmm. Six signs of sexual shame according to sex experts. I'm going to say that all. Six signs of sexual shame according to sex experts. Da, 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 da. Insecurity with yourself. Sexual shame often manifests itself as a disconnection from the self. One of the key components to sexual shame is a break in the natural flow of personal expression of the body, according to sexologist Megwin White. People who identify as women are typically not comfortable with the appearance of their genitals, and they may then experience a Blood of judgment, shame, body insecurity, whatever you want to call it, when they engage in sex. A lot of people have sex with the lights off, right? A lot of people don't want to take off all of their clothes when they have sex. Um, they just want to move things aside and you just stick it in, just stick it in. Like, don't, I don't want you to see anything. I don't want you to look at anything. We always joke about, oh, I didn't shave, so I can't go on a date. Or if I don't shave my legs, it means I'm not going to have sex because who would want to have sex with somebody who's got stubble on their legs? Robert, have you ever turned down sex from a girl who has hair on their legs? No, not because she has hair in her legs. Correct, no. right? No. No, absolutely not. But it's still gross. Shut up. A certain physical stature or a diminished voice. Sexual, sexual shame can also present in how we carry ourselves. So if you cross your arms across your chest or you hunch over or you put your head down, you don't make eye contact with people, you may be experiencing shame in a whole other high other kinds of ways, right? If you are someone who is uh, who doesn't speak loudly or clearly or ask for what you want, you may not believe that you deserve to have sex. You may not believe that you are hot enough to have sex or that you are worthy of that love. Sexual dysfunction. So this one is high for men. Men are terrified that they're not going to be able to get an erection. 
So much so that it can cause performance anxiety where men can't get an erection, which is then a self-fulfilling prophecy of shame because you think that your penis isn't big enough. You think that you're not going to get hard enough. You think that you're not going to be able to penetrate your partner and they're going to enjoy that penetration. Or you think you're not going to be able to reach orgasm because as we all know, the only reason to have sex is for an orgasm. I really hope that you can hear the sarcasm because I'm rolling my eyes so far in the back of my head. I'm going, they're going to pop out the back of my, my fucking eyeballs. Sex should never turn your radio up. Turn it up. Just turn it up just a little bit. Just turn it up a little tiny bit. Sex should never, ever be about the orgasm should always be about the pleasure, the journey, the experience, what you're sharing, learning a new position. You know what? You know what with your fucking horn? Intimacy. (laughs) There it is. Sorry, that was the one I was trying to play. Oh, was it? Yeah, it was. All right. Intimacy, gaining a closeness with your partner should be the goal because if you place this expectation on orgasm can you imagine the mounting phrasing shame that you have when you don't come what if you want to have sex five times in one night you're not going to come all five times but you still can experience pleasure from that experience it's fucking irritating that we think that the come shot is the is the absolute be all end all of sex Intimacy in relationships is another. That's how the porno ends. Of course. Yeah, that's how the porn ends. That's how life is, right? It's exactly like porn, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Anytime we get shut down in a relationship or stonewalled for thinking or saying something that we believe is true for ourselves, we develop an inherent sense of shame. So if you tell your partner, I want to use a vibrator and masturbate, and they tell you, you're cheating on me, you're a whore, which has been said to me before. I don't know about you. But that's I've not had. part of the role playing, and then you do it anyway. I'm sorry. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> Who's my little whore? There you, go. <laughs> you were called a whore before. <laughs> In times of your. Okay. <laughs> Door. Stop it. Uh, yeah, if you want to in- incorporate uh, role play, handcuffs, spanking, and your partner says, oh my God, you want me to hit you? What is the matter with you? Why would I hit you during sex? Why do you need a vibrator when I'm right here? There's shame on both sides. Oh, yeah. Right? Now that one person is saying, I can't fulfill my partner. I'm full of shame, and I'm going to lash out at them. And now the partner is saying, wait a minute. I'm not allowed to be my own gratification when you're not around. I can only experience pleasure when you're here. I had to stop mid Coitus. It's a great tell. fucking word. I use uh, that. That's my favorite, by the way. Side note I played Scrabble once mm-hmm. with Wonderlove, and I went out and won Scrabble on the word coitus. And I spelled it right. Talk about destiny. Hey, yo. Well done. Thank you. Um, yeah, so mid coitus. Um, <laughs> and this girl started calling me daddy. Uh oh. And I, I just stopped her. I was like, uh uh-uh. uh, nope. Sorry. That's not. <laughs> Nope. That makes me my pee pee go pee pee. <laughs> Where's the horn? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and she got kind of like mad about it. Like, yeah. So if someone calls you daddy, what happens to your wee wee? <laughs> <laughs> so future future Mrs. Yeah. Maine, don't call me daddy. No. I'm not having kids either, so that's <laughs> that's not happening. <laughs> Yeah. No one should ever call me that. No. Because what am I supposed to call her? Oh, God. Right? I can't. I'm dead. <laughs> Viewing sex, this is another one. We view sex as something bad or something that you shouldn't do. And this is a huge one for females. So touching yourself is bad. Don't touch down there. So we were talking at the break about why we thought growing up masturbation was a sin when no one ever outright came up to us and said masturbation is a sin. I think it's the way that our bodies are framed to us at a really crucial time. When we're about two or three years old, we start 
understanding our bodies and exploring our bodies and touching ourselves for pleasure. Boy, little boys do it all the time. They grab their wee-wees all the time and they tug on them and they flip them around and they pinch them between their fingers and they're just figuring out what feels good. Little girls do this too. It is more likely that a parent is going to see a little girl touching herself or grinding on a toy to kind of see what feels good and say, oh, that's dirty. We don't do that. We don't touch that part of our bodies. That's naughty. Don't touch that. That's dirty. We don't play with that. You're not supposed to grind on that. You're not supposed... And it embeds in us this idea that anytime we want to experience pleasure in that area, whether it's from ourselves or from someone else, it's bad, it's dirty, and it's wrong. Shame. Shame. And I think that might be where this idea... Because then once we get older and we realize what masturbation is, we go, oh, that's wrong because I'm touching myself and I'm making myself feel better. But that's wrong because someone told me once that that was a bad idea. The idea of masturbation as a shameful act is so damaging because as children, it's our first way that we connect our genitals to sexual pleasure. And we don't want to think about children as sexual beings. But actually, guys, are you ready for the fucking mic drop? We have MRI footage of fetuses masturbating in the womb. We are sexual beings from the time we start forming genitals. So do not shame your children. Teach them the right way to do it. Don't do that in front of all of the people. We're going to go in the bedroom if we want to do that. That's where that's going to happen. Or, hey, we can talk about that. I know that that probably feels good. There's lots of things in this world that feels good. Ice cream feels good. Petting a pony feels good. Never, ever shame your child for exploring their body. Teach them how to do so in a respectful and safe way. The last reason that we have sexual shame is because people don't want to fucking talk about it. Nobody wants to talk about sex. Everybody gets all up in arms when you start saying, hey, I had the best fucking orgasm last night. Everyone's like, oh, what? That's great. <laughs> Good for you. Come on, go get a coffee real quick. Why can't we talk about that? How did you do it? What happened? Why was it good? Maybe I can learn something. Like, we don't want to talk about sexual education. Hey, well, I, I found... Well, you can't really do it at work. No, you can't. Yeah. I mean, you shouldn't. <laughs> you should not talk about sex, politics, or religion in the place of your office. But with your friends, yeah. why can't I sit around the table and say, oh my God, you guys, uh, I tried a new condom. And if you're interested, it's really awesome because it has little ridges on it and it makes sex feel much better. Or you guys, I found the greatest position that actually stimulates the internal clitoris and you should try it if you want. Or hey, I bought a new vibrator and it's wonderful and this is where I bought it from. But we have all these taboos around talking about sex. So of course we feel shame when we experience pleasure. For women... There's so many, I'm not even going to touch the iceberg at this point. I'm literally touching a snowflake of the iceberg. But we also uh, shame women in a lot of ways for their sex. First and foremost, the smell of a woman's vagina is the number one source of shame for a lot of people. Oh. It is for me. Oh. Yeah. That it smells bad. I'm terrified. 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 That someone will say that to Still, you. Still, to this oh. day. Oh, oh Still. That Kevin will will come up for air and be like, I can't do this right now. We got to take care of this situation. Like, don't douche, first and foremost. You don't need to do that. Your body is a magical oven that cleans itself. And you do not need scented vaginal products because no. your vagina smells delicious and it's wonderful and it's a flower. And everyone's vaginal scent is different. It's like a snowflake. Fruity, Telling flowery. Right yeah. Everything. Yep. It doesn't smell like fish. No. Which is what unless I've you don't heard. Bathe. Unless you don't bathe. Right. right? And then that, Just I mean, you know, shower. be clean. Jeez. Yeah. Ever ever had a issue with a girl where you were like, "This is awful." Mm, no, I pick, okay, up pretty, I've I pick asked, up pretty good. I've asked literally like five people, men and women, have you ever had a situation where a vagina just smelled so bad you had to leave? And every single one of them was like, "No." I think it's just something that's ingrained in us. I've had nothing but compliments. <laughs> right? Say, I mean, me too. I but I still have the fucking idea that it's bad. Well, get rid of that. I'm trying. And dudes, wash your balls. Oh, yeah, please. please wash your balls. Those get stinky, too. They do. They Twice definitely. a day, Shmegma. please. Yeah. Twice a day? <laughs> Twice a day. I'm just saying. There's a lot of sweat If you want me there. near them, you're going to wash them. Um, put them well, in my mouth. Yeah, if they, if, I guess, yeah. yeah. If sex is in the mix, yeah. 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 Porn. Women should never watch porn. And if they do, they need to take note. Be loud. Your vagina should be small and shaved. And you should immediately feel pleasure just from the penetration of a penis. And you should come really fast. 
That's Jeez. a porn teacher. I, I guess I should be a porn star. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Big boobs, right? Holy all, oh, yeah. Oh, wait, have... you didn't talk about multiples. <laughs> no, didn't talk about... They don't have that in, in, oh, in porn, okay. I can't be a porn star. <laughs> unfortunately, if you, are, if you are the majority of the women, you are made to be... F- to be abnormal when it comes to porn. You don't look like that because A, you're not an actress. I don't look like fucking Catherine Zeta-Jones and I never expect to. So why do I expect to look like Catherine Zeta-Bones? <laughs> Wish I had a cricket sound effect. There's some crickets around here. Hey guys, go ahead. The other one is sex toy myths. We just talked about this, but uh, some people are told that sex toys are going to desensitize you, that sex toys are going to take your virginity, that sex toys, you don't need a sex toy if you're in a marriage because why would you need another penis if you're married to a penis? And uh, uh, taboo, taboo, taboo. Sex positions. Oh, God, this one. Fuck. On the cover of Cosmo or Marie Claire. Sex positions that'll blow your mind. Sex positions that'll guarantee an orgasm. These are so detrimental to people because they use words like guarantee or blow your mind. And then you attempt them and you break a leg or you chip a tooth because it's (laughs) absolutely impossible based on your body size or based on your, your partner's abilities to hold you against a wall for five minutes like these are so difficult to not only maintain but to live up to the standards to and they only happen in women's magazines and they're women's magazines that are sitting on the grocery shelf these aren't porn magazines i'll say this if it's something you really want to try just try it it's just practice don't expect it to go right the first time and it doesn't need to end in orgasm just don't buy those magazines please don't (laughs) we talk about this a lot who buys magazines seriously (laughs) we talk about these a lot but the concept of virginity is also directly targeted at women and it is one of the most shameful aspects of sex when it comes to women losing your virginity giving someone your flower like i can't fucking stand this shit go back and listen to the other episodes if you want to hear about that justifying gender roles women are supposed to be in missionary they're supposed to be submissive they're supposed to want to just i'm just ready for sex whenever you are no i love To be like, I want to have sex to Kevin and push him on the bed and ride him like a cowgirl and then get off and go take a shower. See you later. Slap him on the butt. Slap him on the ass as I walk away. (laughs) Good game. Yeah. (laughs) We are programmed historically to be submissive to men and to basically be reproductive ovens and not to enjoy sex fully or give blowjobs and not expect oral sex in return. So that is just some of the ways that women are shamed during sex. Here's some ways that men are shamed during sex. Nearly 30% of men fear they ejaculate too soon. On average, the average heterosexual sexual intercourse with penetration, not including foreplay, lasts about seven minutes. That's the average for most heterosexual couples. It's extremely longer for lesbians like we, d- we discussed this in the episode uh, zippity doodah with Stephanie and Ashley about how they can have sex literally for five hours and they f- like fly into another time zone and they wake up in May and it was December when they started lesbians have the longest sex it's just it's absolutely known but men seem to have this idea that they have to be powerful and exaggerated and strong and that they always have to be ready for sex and that sex is something that they use as a tool and that they always have to come and that their cum shot is really big deal. So if they don't have a lot of cum, then they're not a decent man. This is ridiculous. The other thing that men fear is their body image. You take off your shirt and if you have a a belly or if you have body hair or if your penis isn't nine feet long somehow you are less than okay so i'm not a man so i really wanted to just pass it over to you and ask you on the spot always poor little is there a man here (laughs) oh frank i'm the boy where's frank Uh, boy yeah, Frank's Frank, more of a dude than I am. Cat, what, what, what do you think about the yeah. sexual stereotypes that are put on men? Have you ever felt shame in a sexual experience, or have you ever questioned your ability as a man in a sexual experience because of something that was ingrained in you? Well, this kind of touches on our last episode, one of the last ones about virginity. Mm-hmm. How the first time, just it's not good. A lot of people, it's, <laughs> it's if if if, you, if I was saying if. If the first time you have sex and it's the best sex you've ever had in your life, hey, 
Good for you. Actually, that's not very good rare. for you. That's very sad. If that's, that's the best oh, sex you've also ever sad, had, but Jesus like, Christ. Could yeah, be a lie. It's very rare. So, <laughs> yeah, there's some pressure on that. Do you ever feel bad that, that it's almost like men are, are supposed to want to fuck and then go eat a sandwich like do you ever just want to cuddle after sex and then kind of feel like you're not supposed to do oh, that why, why are we throwing the sandwich out i'm down for no i'm I, down for I a get, sandwich i get hungry after. no no i'm down for a sandwich yeah, yeah. but like cuddle sandwich into cuddling wait a minute there's a seinfeld episode in there with george <laughs> and his sandwich after sex i was just watching that he starts and then he starts <laughs> reaching too close right. to the sun and starts watching <laughs> baseball games there's also a great um uh, what's that movie with Seth Rogen and uh, they're in the house next to the fratern- fraternity? Oh my god! Like the hot dude. Oh my god! 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 With Zac Efron. Yeah, he's in bed with his wife and like they're tired or something, and he just brings out neighbors. Yeah, he just brings out pizza out of nowhere. And she's like, "Where'd you get that?" He's like, "I have it." And then he goes, "I also have ranch," and it's got a plate of ranch. He's like, "She's like, I love you." And it's like, yeah, that's what I want. So, the un- um, yeah. The, the unfortunate thing is that men are told that intimacy is not okay, right? When you see your friends, you high five or you do the the bro hug where you hit three times. You ever heard of that that theory? Yeah. No. Okay, here's the theory, because I've heard this theory quite frequently, and I've heard it a lot. When dudes hug and they hit each other's back, one, two, three. Don't do that it's to the mic. It's supposed to God be, it. I just want you to hear it, I'm not gay. <gasps> wow, never heard that. Oh, I've, I've heard, heard it a ton. <laughs> so, a ton. So I'm going to start hugging people with just two taps. <laughs> I'm just, gay. just confusing. <laughs> or just change it to I'm super gay. Yeah, <laughs> That's four taps. Well, I'm, I'm not super gay. gay. Take it easy, okay? Take it easy. <laughs> they shake hands. They may even like... Uh, I've never heard that. I, I have a ton of times, and I don't think I'm alone. Someone tell me if I'm alone. If I'm alone, I'm alone. It's fine. Well, can we go back real quick? The, yeah. With, well, you're taking about the sandwich. I was thinking like the, the, sh- the pressure and shame, I guess, of like dudes going again. Oh, mm-hmm. That's, Sorry, for me, I can't do that. That's called a refractory I need, period. I need like five, maybe, ten minutes. No, I no, no, no. I need hours. Okay. If we're doing it in the morning, yeah. hit me up again in the night. So yeah. It's, it's one and done. Everyone has a Sorry. refractory period, men especially, and it's the time in between the plateau, the orgasm, mm-hmm. and the next time you're able to get aroused. And the refractory period is a very, very, very real medical thing. And there's a way to actually shorten your refractory period, which we can actually talk about in another episode called edging, which is a brilliant technique. Oh, but but you're not coming. Right. But you're getting yourself there and then yeah. pu- dialing. Oh. But, but it helps the refractory period. I'm just saying it's, oh. it's a way to help your refractory period get shorter. But yeah, a lot of women don't know what a refractory period is and they don't realize that men yeah. physically cannot get another erection for a distinguished amount of time based on that man. Could you imagine if men had the ability to orgasm like women did? No. Nothing would get done. Nothing. You guys could... I mean, you guys get bored eventually. Dudes would just do it all. I mean, we already do it all day, but instead of like yeah, twenty, if you could it'd be have 200. seven <laughs> orgasms in a row. Nothing would get nothing it's, would be, be done. super messy. So. It'd be very messy. <laughs> it'd be did, a lot of come. God everywhere. did a pretty pretty good job on limiting yeah. our. The other thing that I think take. I think that men I think that men get shamed for is that they aren't allowed to explore certain fantasies that they have in regards to sex. If a man wants his prostate stimulated, which by the way is considered the male quote unquote G spot, I fucking hate that phrase, but it is considered a very highly sensitive area, but in order to reach that area, you have to go through the anus. And it's not like you have to stick a dildo in there. A thumb will do. A pinky will do. But because we have this idea that anything that goes in your butt means you're gay, men run away from this amazing, possibly mind-blowing, pleasurable orgasm because they don't want to be seen as gay. I don't want anything in my butt. Uh, Do you want anything in your butt? I've had things in my butt. Do you want things in your butt? I don't have a prostate. So it doesn't yeah. feel as good mm. for me. Okay. I myself want nothing in my butt See, exactly. because that's where poop comes from. So, and that's great. That's fine. But there is a spot, the prostate, in the male yeah, anus that's true. that actually can release a different orgasm than you've ever had before. Well, it's like our G spot. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Okay. See, again, there's shame. <laughs> Don't shame. I'm not shaming. Don't shame. He just doesn't want anything up his butt. I, got, I have a new uh, <laughs> metaphor for the G spot. 
good because I hate that name. Since we do home run for virginity, okay. and that is the perfect game. You hit the perfect spot, the perfect game. Oh. You threw the perfect game. Oh. The first thought was like a no hitter. I was like, no, that doesn't make any sense. No, that doesn't. No, perfect, perfect game. game. Yeah. No walks, yeah. no hits. Yeah. The other thing is, right. what if a man wants to be dominated? What or if he wants to be inside the park home run? That'd oh, that's a good inside, inside the park, park bro. That's better. Okay, that's better. Okay. The other thing is, men are told that they're not supposed to be vulnerable. So, what if they want to be dominated? What if they want to be tied up? What if they want to be spanked? What if that's their ultimate fantasy? But men are told they they have to be the dominant ones. They have to be the strong ones. It's all very masculine, and it doesn't have to be. This also perpetuates this idea of rape culture, when a man has to be dominant, assertive, take what he wants. Coming is the only option. It's like a military mission. I'm going to go in. Coming is the only option. Leave no man in the balls, right? Like you, you, <laughs> You've got to end it this way. Why? Why can't it just be about fucking? Why does it have to be about coming? Why does it have to be about I'm on top? Why can't I be on top? Why does it have to be about the only way to have an orgasm is through penile vaginal penetration? When pegging is a very real fantasy for some men, and it doesn't mean there is anything wrong with your sexuality whatsoever. I think that our culture needs to focus more on our relationships and social justice rather than particular sex acts. So how do we stop sexual shame? I don't know. I feel like you're shaming me to do butt stuff. I'm not shaming you to do butt stuff. I'm just telling you that some people want it, and it's fine. I just think being open and honest with your partner. Communication. That's it. Dun, da, da, da. Get a scouting report I on get your partner. A, a scouting that. report. <laughs> I love the baseball puns, or not puns, metaphors. No, metaphors are great. So we want to make sure that we are identifying the shame message and where it came from, just like we did right now. Where did the message from masturbation come from? Probably from when we were children and told not to touch our genitalia. Or religion. Or religion, who says, if you masturbate, your penis will fall off. Or religion where Dr. Kellogg, who created cornflakes, invented a cereal, hoping it would stop boys from wanting to masturbate. The idea that if you masturbate, your your palms will turn hairy. Yeah. The idea that if a girl has sex too much, her vagina will get stretched out. Like, come on, you guys. I actually had someone that we mutually know tell me that if I used a vibrator that I would just wear out my vagina, that it would not work anymore. Like but it's I'll, a rubber band? I'll tell you. Yeah, my clitoris. He said my, my I would completely oh. just ruin my Oh, like, rub, like an eraser. Yeah. Like if you use yeah. your clitoris too much, yeah. it eventually yeah. rubs down yeah. and it's gone. I'm going to tell you after. Uh, decide whether you agree with the shame message or not. You can decide if spanking makes you a bad person. You can decide if your thighs are hideous and monstrous. But you should really identify where this message is coming from and whether or not it's a healthy message. Change the story. Instead of saying, wear lingerie, don't let him see my thighs, change the story and say, my body is beautiful and worthy of pleasure. And if this person doesn't want to see my thighs, then they're not worthy of having sex with me. Change the story. Instead of saying, if I wear this dress, people will think I'm a slut. Say, I love the way this dress makes me feel and I'm going to be confident when I go to this party. Shift your perspective. Notice and honor your body. Make sure that you are in touch with what you want, with your fantasies, with your desires. Do not poison other people with your shame. I can't believe that that girl dresses like that. What a whore. Or, wow, he's really trying to fuck someone with a dick that small. We do this all the time to people. And we need to stop. We are sexually shaming others because we ourselves feel shameful. And when we project our shame onto other people, not only do we perpetuate a culture of shame and sexual shame, but we are also keeping ourselves from living our best sexual lives. It is absolutely important that you look at the behaviors you're engaging in and making sure that they are safe and making sure that they are consensual and making sure that everyone involved is having a good time. Pleasure is key. If you're experiencing pleasure, you should be happy, not shameful. And if orgasm comes from that, good on you. And if it doesn't, enjoy the ride. The ride doesn't always have to be a roller coaster with a really big belly drop at the end. The ride can be Winnie the fucking Pooh. 
right? Mm -hmm. I love Disneyland. (laughs) God damn it. Final thoughts on shame? Um, I, I think there is some good things to shame because, okay. All um, right. If you look at some Asian cultures and how they should not in sexuality, but in just, I'm not, I don't know exact instances, but I know in those like Japan and like mostly Japan, I'm thinking is they shame like their society, people in society for not doing the right thing. Like littering, like the whole neighborhood will like shame that person. Like, how can you fucking- Do you not think that there's a better way to educate people on not to litter besides shaming somebody? Like, don't we? Isn't don't there know. a better way? How do we train dogs? Reinforcement. So, sorry to. Well, true. But when they do stuff bad, we don't give them treats to do stuff bad. And I'm sorry to compare humans and, and dogs. Oh, no, I do it all the time. But we're, we're both animals and it's we both need training. I think that shame and reinforcement are two different things. True. I mean, yeah, you reinforce when they do the good things, but you... You can use negative reinforcement for bad, too. Yeah, and that's shame. But sh- I don't agree. I think that shame is a dangerous weapon. And I think that there are other ways to teach people through negative reinforcement than by shaming them, personally. Audience? Positive correction, not shame. I'm, I'm not saying don't do that. I do it at work all the time when people... And if they repeatedly do the, the wrong thing... I. Try to change my verbiage, try to readjust their path, but shaming them. I thought about it yesterday because there's a person that keeps making these mistakes, and I'm like, and I remember being shamed at a job I had during COVID that made me crazy because the guy kept shaming me, and I thought, oh my God. Making you feel stupid. I don't want to be that guy. Mm-hmm. I need to figure out how to correct her without making her feel shamed because mm-hmm. that's why I hated that job. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's ways of doing it that should not create shame, but. A positive way to change, right? Positive shame. and negative reinforcement. Shame is negative. Huge. Yeah, I, 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 and negative reinforcement is removing something. So, let's say you litter. Um, you don't get to. I, I don't know if you if you throw away a candy wrapper, you no longer get candy. Well, you pay a fine, or you pay a fine. You lose a money. Big fine. Yeah, you lose money. Yeah. Right. That's negative reinforcement because you are losing something. Instead of saying you're a bad person, yeah. But everyone I- walking out, shame, shame. Oh my god! And then handma- Handmaid's Tale, they oh, do that all the time. Shame. Like, no, shame. no, no. The whose fault? Her fault. Yeah. Whose fault? Her fault. Like that's fucking fucked up. That show got, by the way, Handmaid's Tale. First two seasons. Third, fourth season. Beep. First two, pretty great. Shame is, uh, I believe, one of the most detrimental things we can do as a society when it comes to sex. And it's eye-opening to do these episodes because I don't really realize how much shame I have until I talk about it. So anybody has any thoughts about shame? Give us a call. 513-6969. Have you ever been shamed in your life and just now realized it? Is there anything that you are going to do to change that in your life? I really want everyone to embrace their bodies, embrace their sexuality, embrace their vaginas and their penises and their fantasies and their desires. Communicate with your partners. Consent is huge. Sext your husband, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your partner, whoever. Love your thighs. Love your ass. Masturbate all day long. Do it. As long as you're not at work. As long as you're not at work. Well, what if you go to your car on break? All good. Because that's your car, right? If Kevin wants to come and have a quickie in the back of the parking lot of the car and we're not hurting anybody, I feel like that's fine. I'm not going to do it on my office, but I mean, unless no one's... No, I'm not going to do that. Uh, (laughs) Embrace who you are. Love who you are. Learn the difference between shame and guilt. And let's get rid of shame. Mm. Plus, it comes to littering and using your turn signal. I'm going to shame the shit. I can't with you right now. I like that part. Give us a call. 513-696-SEX. Follow us on Instagram at What's Your Position. Remember that I love you very much. I'm not going to shame you, and I'm going to do my best to stop shaming people. I really am. It's going to be something that I'm going to work on, including myself. Uh, Have a great fucking weekend. Stay safe. Stay kind. Stay sexy.
smoke. Not a garden snake, I need a king cobra with a hook in it. Hope it lead over. He got some money, then that's where I'm headed. Pussy A1, just like his credit. He got a beard, well, I'm trying to wet it. I let him piss, now he diabetic. I don't want to spit, I want to go. I want to gag, I want to choke. I want you to touch that little dangly thing that's swinging the back of my throat. My head is fire. What's Your Position podcast represents the opinions of Ashley Weller and her guests. The content here should not be taken as medical advice and is intended for education and entertainment purposes only. Views and opinions expressed in the podcast are our own and do not represent that of our places of work. While we make every effort to ensure the information we are sharing is accurate, we welcome any comments, suggestions, or correction of error. Stay safe, stay kind, and stay sexy. Yeah, yeah, you fucking with some wet ass pussy. Bring a bucket and a mop for this wet ass pussy. Give me everything you got for this wet ass pussy. Now from the top, make it drop. That's some wet ass pussy. Now get a bucket and a mop. That's some wet ass pussy. I'm talking wop, wop, wop. That's some wet ass pussy. Macaroni in a pot. That's some wet ass pussy. Huh.